I'm so pleased to introduce our next speaker, a bit of a shift. Um, the title of his talk is The End of Oil for Peace. Um, and Mark Campanelli has received numerous awards, including the Joan Bavaria Award uh, for um, Investment Responsibility. He's on the advisory board of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, where $130 trillion uh, banks who manage $130 trillion have made commitments to net zero and are part of that group, and he's an advisor. He is the founder of the Carbon Tracker Initiative and has 20 years of uh, sustainable financial markets experience before that. So please join me in welcoming Mark Campanelli to the stage. Thanks, Amy. Just want you to think about this for a moment. We're the first generation in human history since the time of the Neanderthals to do all the critical things that keep us alive without having to burn something. Our cooking, our heating, moving from A to B, and the power systems that we use for industry. We can do all of those things using electrons, not using molecules. The whole energy system um, that we've been dependent upon is going through a massive transformation. And this energy transition actually, as we see it, represents the biggest opportunity for financial markets. Now, what have we got with the energy system? There's two parts to it I want you to think about. There's the physical part of the energy system, the power stations, your cars, the refineries, the oil pipelines. And then you've got the actual use of it, which is your cars and your coal-fired power stations and your oil. So you've got a stock and you've got a flow. Now, in the new energy system, we're going to lose half of it. The energy system's going to get smaller. We're not going to need tankers uh, carrying oil from one side of the world to the other. And we're not going to need to take coal from one part of the US to the other to burn in a power station. All of that disappears. And to address climate change, we know that we have to drop emissions by 50% in the next 10 years. This transformation is going to be driven by technology. Now, I'm not one who says that climate change, we're going to solve it all by technology. I think we need policy, we need collective action, but I do think right now we have all the available technologies we, ha we need to get to address the climate change problem. Now, where is the financial risk in all of this? Carbon Tracker, my nonprofit, we estimate that something like a quarter of the world's equity markets are linked to the fossil fuel system, shipping, aviation, oil and gas, and about half of the world's corporate bond markets are linked to the fossil fuel system. And it's around $30 trillion, three or four times bigger than the financial crisis of 07, 08. We're going to see huge write downs in the value of oil and gas assets and coal assets in coming years because of this technology transition. Now just think for a moment, if CO2 wasn't a problem, um, would we still transition? Would we still be burning things in cars? And I, I think we would still transition for the simple reasons that I'm gonna set up for you now. Now what you're looking at, I'm afraid, is a bit <laughs> difficult to see the detail, but I wanna make some simple points. On the left here, you've got the levelized, what's called the levelized cost of energy. How much does it cost for you to, to create and uh, use your energy? And along the bottom, you've got cumulative megawatt hours. And what you're looking at here are technologies. Offshore wind there on the blue, the collapsing costs of production for solar, your offshore wind, um, and nuclear. Okay, there's a place for nuclear, but it's not on the same learning curves that you see with all these other cleaner technologies. Um, coal. Coal hasn't gone through what you call learning curves. It's not a technology. The more you use, it doesn't get cheaper. All the other technologies are distinguished by the fact that the more you use, the cheaper they get. And this is what's driving this transition. So uh, the other thing about it to, to, is it's cheaper to run. Now, once you've built your solar system or your wind system, you're not having to buy in these flows of coal and, and oil and gas to run it. This, the energy is essentially free. It's around us, the sun, the wind, waves, all these cleaner technologies. And what you're again looking at here is the price of uh, a megawatt hour for using your cheaper technologies against the fossil fuel technologies. And what you're looking at here is how just the costs of solar and wind 
are just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Now, the thing that the fossil fuel industry, with its subsidies, has been able to say, is that, look, there's no replacement. There's no replacement for this. We're addicted to the fact that if you want to drive from A to B, we've got to go down to a gas station every couple of days and fill up. Um, all those things, we don't have to do those things anymore. We can use electricity and store our energy and battery systems. This new thing that's just come in, that little squiggle that we put there, this is just the other month, the cost of gas, four times greater than um, it was just a few years ago. And I think I was looking at the statistics in the US, there's 23 million households in the US that are in arrears for their energy and are in energy poverty because fossil fuels is an expensive system. Few suppliers controlling multiple users. It's a kind of a monopoly. What the renewable energy revolution is doing is getting rid of that monopoly system. And the great news for all of us, it's universal. Africa and Asia have a thousand times more renewable energy resources than they have fossil fuel resources. It's just a matter now of scaling up these technologies and making them available. Now, private capital, which is the world I've come from, has spotted this. Look at the installed uh, energy over the last um, couple of decades in the renewable energy space, and it's been dominated by, by what we call manufactured energy. Energy that you make through things like fuel cells, uh, solar and wind. And the capital is being deployed to find, take advantage of these opportunities. Has it needed government policy? Sure, it's needed government policy. But once it's in place, the technology is just getting cheaper and cheaper and growth across the board. It's been an extraordinary story of growth. And we've seen this before. We've seen this before. What you're looking at here is all the old technologies of the telephone, of the stoves, clothes washers and clothes dryers and dishwashers and air conditioners. It shows you how many years it takes from launch to universal adoption, of course, in 1990, just a decade or so for the internet and the computer. Exactly the same thing is happening around the world with clean energy. It's going through a, what we call um, the phenomenon of rights law. The more you use, the cheaper it gets. The cheaper it gets, the more competitive it gets. The more competitive it gets, demand rises, and of course, people build more. So the fossil fuel industry, where, what are their thoughts? Where are they at in all of this? Now, I was reading this morning that um, just last month, we had the highest concentration of carbon dioxide recorded um, using going back through the ice and to do the calculation in over 4 million years. What is the fossil fuel industry planning to do? Well, they're planning to go and find more. They're planning to expand. What you're looking at here is the steep curves downwards that we need to get to to get to net zero versus the plans of Exxon and Chevron and the models from banks like Citi, all forecasting growth. And because they're forecasting growth, in come the banks to fund more growth in fossil fuels. And this is where we get what the we call the phenomenon of unburnable carbon or stranded assets. The International Energy Agency said last year, no new oil and gas is needed anywhere for the world to achieve net zero. And this is the challenge to the banks like JP Morgan and Citi and others who continue to fund fossil fuels. And this is where we have to draw the line with the technologies that we've found. Now, what does this mean for investors, which is a community that I know best, and I want to dip into that for a minute, is peaks happen when technology takes all incremental growth and investors lose money at the peak of the system, not when the system has changed. People say to me, well, of course, Mark, fossil fuels are still 70, 80% of the fossil fuel system. My money is fine. Well, actually, markets don't work like that. I'm going to explain why. What this shows you in red is the sale of internal combustion engines. And what you're looking at in green is plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and battery uh, electric vehicles. Total new sales. And we reckon within just a few years, the majority, if not all, sales of new cars are going to be electrified, certainly in OECD countries, certainly in, in Europe. Now, the real question is, how many electric vehicles do you need on the road to kill oil demand? That's the figure I want to know. This is Oslo. In the purple is the numbers of new electric cars on the road. Oslo, full of electric cars. I'd love to see the same in New York. And 
the figure in the dotted red down is the fallen emissions as electric vehicles rise. And on the right, this is a new report that came out from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, looks at the millions of barrels of oil a day that have been displaced from electric vehicles and from fuel cell vehicles as well. And this is the exciting thing that we're ha having, seeing is electric vehicles and electrification is beginning to destroy oil demand. <coughs> is this enough? We need to multiply and scale up these clean energy sources by eightfold, tenfold, twentyfold across all the clean technologies. This is the challenge that we have to go into. So why does the peak in demand for oil and gas, why does this matter so much? And why does electrification matter so much? And why does solar matter so much? Well, as like I've just shown you, the big companies like Exxon and Chevron are building an expectation of growth. The incumbents, which is that group along the top, the incumbent expectations, expect the world's going to be needing more oil and gas or indeed coal. And along comes the bottom, the challenges. The little innovative companies are not so little now, companies like Tesla, challenging the incumbents. And as they challenge them, incumbents' actual sales are beginning to fall. And remember, it was just a small drop in demand for oil, 5% drop caused negative oil prices just last year. Everyone's forgotten that. Everyone's looking at oil prices today, going through the roof, and we forget that oil, oil demand was down 5%, but we had negative prices last year. And the same thing, I believe, will happen in coming years. So how do markets react? Well, there's the volume and the decline in the volume of whatever it might be, coal, oil, and gas. But prices in markets, if any of you are investors, prices often peak way in advance before the volume uh, sales of sales actually peaks. So I'm just going to give you an example. Some of you may be invested in Netflix. Uh, now, what happened two weeks ago? I'm going to tell a little bit about the history of Netflix. Two weeks ago, um, they got 200 million customers. They lost 2 million subscribers. How much did the stock price fall by? What was it, 40%? There's a story in there. There's this little story in there because actually markets will begin to respond to derating companies like Chevron and Exxon in the same way. So what you're looking at here in the blue is our old company, Blockbuster. Remember, we used to go down to the, the town, take out your video. If you forgot to take it back, for those that knew, well, know what a video is, uh, you got fined. Um, and there were 80,000 people working at Blockbuster. There was one in every town and every country around the world. And a few years in, Netflix was founded, 1997, 1998, around that kind of period. But in comes Netflix, 1999 really started to take off. And what you're looking at here is sales. And you're looking at sales peaked 2003. And by the time Netflix sales passed, passed Blockbusters, that's when Blockbuster went bankrupt. The key one I want you to look at is when did Blockbuster stock peak? Their stock peaked way in advance of their sales peaking. So this is a little bit of financial way of saying that markets can discount the future. I think exactly the same thing is going to happen to the world's fossil fuel system. Investors are canny enough and smart enough to see that the cleaner technologies of wind and solar, the electric vehicles are going to displace. They're getting cheaper, they're more reliable. Those that follow me on Twitter, I'm at Campanali Mark. I tweet a lot about the new announcements from companies like Ford about getting uh, cheaper batteries and the car down to $25,000. And actually, the traditional fossil fuel system is going through what we call the five stages of, of decline. Hubris born of success. Undisciplined pursuits of more. Let's go and find some more of this stuff. The denial of risk and peril. Our electric vehicles is just a sideshow. Wind and solar, it's, it's not reliable. Um, and then grasping for salvation. As we work out systems of battery storage, working together with solar, creating reliable, cheap, clean energy for all to the point of grasping salvation and then ultimately capitulation and irrelevance. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Um, is history going to repeat itself? We've seen this storyboard before. Kodak owned a digital camera division, which has said, oh, yeah, we have digital cameras. That's just a sideshow. We're going to double down 
on traditional print film just before Kodak went bust. Blockbuster, I wonder what the board was saying when Netflix arrived. They didn't buy Netflix, which they could have done. They blockbuster doubled down, they went bust. Peabody Energy, in its accounts, the year before they went bust, they said, demand for coal is robust. Why didn't Olivetti, the typewriter, why didn't they become Apple? And there's a little train company in there called Baldwin Locomotives. Um, Baldwin, an American company, the chief executive and the chairman, when asked why you're investing in more efficient steam engines, said, mark my words, the steam engine will be the dominant form of transport well into the 1980s. This was in the 1930s, just a couple of years before they went bust. I think the same is going to happen with fossil fuels. We're entering the end of the fossil fuel system. Thank you very much.